Yes, we are um, going into 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. You know that last time we were here, I told you that uh, the verses that I'm covering really uh, was intended to be one message, just hard to make uh, that one message out of verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> so I found out by one guy's interpretation that I am not an expositional preacher. Uh, because I go to one passage and then I go to another passage. Uh, so apparently, if you don't stay on that one verse the whole time or that one section of scripture, you're not an expositional preacher. I apologize. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I am except for deficient, uh, but I know that the word of God is sufficient. And let me tell you, though, doctrinally why I do what I do. And by the way, I'm not offended. It's like, one guy's, one guy's opinion, and, and uh, hey, we're all going to stand before the Lord, and I don't think anyone wants to stand before the Lord and go, what a piece of work you were, you know? <laughs> um, but I, uh, what I do, and I try to do this faithfully, and if you haven't quite caught it yet, um, you'll see it happen today. I get into the passage, and I want to maintain the context of the passage. I think where topical preaching often is uh, deficient is that you cherry pick to take a verse, make it say what you want it to say, and then get on your soapbox and, and preach that. Um, that is not what we're doing, and though I know that while we reference a lot of other passages, the reason we reference those other passages is, is that is what we call comparing Scripture with Scripture and rightly dividing the word. So we look for where does the Bible teach this elsewhere that undergirds what this passage teaches while maintaining the context of this passage. So this passage has a particular truth uh, to a particular people at a particular time in history that has its meaning. But this is also written for us so that we would know what God's mind is, be able to then apply it to our lives in a way that glorifies God. And the way that we do that accurately is compare Scripture with Scripture. So that's what we're going to do. The message title today is, it's, this is a broader section of the message of reconciliation. Uh, but this morning, the major uh, aspect is consecration. We looked at constraining and consecration because of verse 14, constraining. And I defined that last week, looked at what it meant. We'll probably rehearse that just a little bit today. Uh, but verse 15 is largely where we are this morning. So thanks for being with us. We're going to dive into the Word of God, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you before I pray, um, everything in me wants to, uh, that's not true, not everything in me, uh, maybe 60% maybe, uh, of me wants to go somewhere else and tell you what God is doing uh, and to, to explain to you what's happened. Um, and I really want to do that. But I also really believe in preaching what's got to be said this morning because the Word of God is what we need. And it would be both, just so you know. But we're going to anchor on here and carry on here and uh, share with you what I think God would have all of us know. Before we do, I just want to declare in this place that God is good and I'm so thankful for uh, the person that He is and that He, through His grace, offers salvation to everybody. And if you know Him this morning, you ought to be rejoicing. Rejoicing. And if you don't know him, you ought to rejoice that the invitation to know him is right in front of you. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Would you read with me? We're going to go from verses 11 through verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 15. Reading out loud with me. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And all God's people said. So the word of God is good, and God does mean what he says, and he gives us here some instruction that is worthy of our knowledge. Uh, last week, 
uh, as we embarked upon these two verses. Uh, it took a lot of time to define the word constraineth, and it has two major aspects as a way of rehearsal. It has as its aspect the idea of control. And um, matter of fact, we don't like it when people a lot of times exercise control in our lives, do we? We really don't like when people try to tell us what to do. Matter of fact, if somebody really starts trying to tell us what to do, we've got all kinds of names for them. One of those being, well, you're just a control freak, right? Uh, and we, we kind of naturally rebel against it. We just, we just went through TSA however many times. That was a lot of fun, you know. <laughs> Uh, and they do tell you what to do and how to do it. And, uh, you know, there's a, sometimes you find people that really don't like that. That makes life exciting uh, for those that have cameras to video it all. Uh, but, you know, it's this aspect that control over our lives is something that we can rebel against. I'm bringing it up again this morning to remind us that the other aspect of control is the idea of being squeezed in. The idea of being funneled to a direction. And it is the idea where God wants to control your life. He really does. And I understand that each of us can have our own um, perspective of our own sense of rebellion to that idea. But I want to say that if we're going to worship the Lord in honesty, we have to own these doctrines in reality. If we're going to worship the Lord honestly, we have to own these doctrines in reality. And the reality is that God does want to control and be the controlling factor in our lives. He wants to be the one that walks with us through every circumstance of life, directs what we do, gives us the purpose of living and why we do what we do, but it's to be under the banner of fellowship with him. It's under the banner that God in his mercy and in his grace has invited us into relationship with him through the gospel. And as we look at that, the love of Christ is what Paul said motivated him for ministry. It's what made him do what he did. As you go back through the passage, uh, it talks about the idea of heaven. Even back in the first verse, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God in house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You go from that doctrine, and Paul is just saying, I know the word of God to be true. I know that what he says is so, and who he is and what he says is not only worth living for, he's worth dying for. Because it's in Christ that I really have life. Now, as you come to this next passage, let's read a little further there. We ju thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. All right, under this banner, under this banner of consecration, when it says, if one died for all, then we're all dead, we're going to start here with the scope of Christ's payment. There are two S's in this morning's breakdown of verse 15. That is the scope of Christ's payment and the sacrifice involved in Christ's payment. The scope of Christ's payment is that it says in the very first part of 15, verse 15, and that he died for how many? He died for all. Christ died for all so that all could be saved. Amen? This is the good news of the gospel. I met a guy at, uh, I didn't actually meet him. I had somebody point him out to me. Uh, I don't know what country he's from, but somebody uh, tapped me on the shoulder, pointed, pointed to a guy. He's like 6'6". He's like six, six. And uh, he said, see that guy? His, he said, his name is Good News. And he said, that's what his name is, Good News. And this is what we carry around in the gospel, the good news of the saving power of Christ. Anybody you know need some good news? Amen. Anybody you know needs uh, some hope that only God can give? Uh, I really, I, I hesitate a little bit here to tell the full story. Um, I'll tell a little bit of it, and I hope Pastor Phil can give his own, his own scope of reference. That's like, that's like me getting first shot at stealing the illustration, right? So this poor lady, we, her, her name's Ellery. Uh, I really hope, I feel like God put us right beside her on purpose. Uh, she's sitting at the window seat, nowhere to go, because right next to her is Pastor Phil, and on the other side of him is me, and... Hi, Ellery. <laughs> and she was friendly. She was friendly. Pastor Phil, what did she ask us? What do we do? 
Does she ask? What, yeah, what denomination are we or what, what? It didn't take much, all right? And we were immediately for a long time talking about the gospel. And by the way, uh, you pray for Ellery. I'm telling you, I think that there's a door for her to be right here in our office talking to Pastor Phil and myself about some things that God's doing. Uh, so I think that's a real opportunity that's going to happen. But we got to on that plane ride talk to Ellery about Jesus Christ. Amen? And uh, it was really a great blessing to talk to a lost person who didn't, a matter of fact, I think her own statements, Pastor Phil can give better clarity and detail. But when we asked her about Jesus, she said, I really don't know much. Now, now, by the way, isn't that crazy right here in the United States? Coming right out of Boise is this lady that doesn't know much about Jesus. You and I have got to get over the idea that somehow the mission field is off continent somewhere. The mission field is right here. The mission field is right here. There are people that need to know Jesus. It could be your neighbor that has never heard who Jesus is. Now, she knew some things about Jesus, but she did not certainly understand the gospel or what it meant to know him, nor the understanding of how you could trust who he is or what the Bible says. It was a great conversation. And, and though we did not see Ellery come to Christ on that plane ride, I can guarantee you this. We pointed her to what it means to be a disciple of Christ. We pointed her towards Jesus. Did we get the full conversation? No. But I, if I gave you all the details, I think you would understand why I'm saying I really believe that Ellery is going to be in my office and we're going to be talking about some things in the future. I really believe that's going to happen. You pray that way. But here's the thing. There's the good news that Ellery needs. And this is one of the things that she said, and I'll just loosely paraphrase it. She basically said she hopes, she hopes there's something beyond this life. Aren't you glad that there is? Now, you can say amen to that because you know Jesus and there's something to look forward to. Amen? For those that don't know him, there's something in front of them as well. And it is horrific. So you and I have been entrusted with this message and the scope of Christ's payment is that he died for all. I'm just going to say out loud and I hope that uh, we can be friends in Christ about this, but this directly confronts the L of the tulip explanation of Calvinistic doctrine and that is limited atonement. The idea that Christ died only for the elect's sake. The gospel, hear me please, the gospel is open to all. And I know that there are theologians that disagree. There are smarter than men than me that can argue over different aspects of uh, those doctrines. But I'm simply coming to the word of God and I just can't get around the fact that the offer of the gospel is to everyone. And if you disagree with that because of your doctrine, uh, I appreciate what one person said. Really, there is no conflict here except for that which is interposed based on preconceived notions of doctrine. In other words, if you just take the Bible at what it says here, it seems pretty clear for me, doesn't it to you? And that he died for all. How we would try to argue ourselves out of that or squeeze ourselves out of that and to what end, I don't understand. But here's the, po the point. The scope of Christ's payment is that Jesus died so that anyone that wants to be can be saved. He died to offer that to everyone. Now, that's our first point, and you're excited because look how quickly we went through that. Okay, the scope of Christ's payment. And now we're going to look at the sacrifice involved in Christ's payment. Now, I want to take some time here because we looked at last week being constrained, being controlled, being squeezed into a direction. As we've talked about, it's coming up here this next Sunday's Roundup Sunday. Uh, I have the invitations on my desk. What you and I are doing right now, we should be doing this week, is you and I are the cowboys and the cowgirls going out into the fields and the byways. Could be next door, could be at your workplace, could be wherever it is. And you and I are throwing the broad net saying, hey, come. We're bringing people in. You've heard the song, bring them in, bring them in. And the idea is that we would go out and try to let other people know, hey, you can hear about God. You can hear the truth of the gospel. And by the way, you don't have to bring them here to do that. Amen. A matter of fact, if they come next week, I'm going to try to preach a simple gospel message, but I'm really hoping that 
you visiting with someone will be able to expand upon that knowledge that they hear in that service and point them to Jesus. I'm really hoping that you will pray that way. Will you? Pray that way next week that we'll be able to point people to Christ, right? So here's the thing. Christ died for all, but here's what I think we all need to know. Christ did not die for you simply so that you can be in heaven. Now, I didn't hear any amens on that, but that's an amen, and it's the truth. He did not die for you. It's been often said this way. Christ did not die for you just to give you fire insurance. Now, I, I'm thankful that the Lord rescues us from that awful place called hell. Amen? That is worthy of our gratitude. Matter of fact, do you like to have your life in jeopardy? Do you like it? Do you, in other words, when you, when you get scared for your life, that is not exactly a, a peace-filled thing, is it? Do you know what it's like to be on an airplane and have what they call moderate turbulence? <laughs> Pastor Phil told me what they called it. He said they call it moderate turbulence. I call it high anxiety. And that's what it is. And it's one of those things where you're not just, you're not just getting a little, oh, oh, that, oh, I lost my stomach. Oh, that, no. It's, it's boom, 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 boom. <laughs> That is not exactly, matter of fact, you know what I, I, I find believers tend to do at that time? Well, I don't know what you're doing, I'm praying. That is what I'm doing. Uh, matter of fact, I met a pilot right before we got on the airplane, had a little conversation before, with her, and she was doing her last leg of the journey coming into Boise. And the last thing I said to her is, I, I really hope you get where you're going. Because <laughs> we're on the same plane, right? Uh, so here's the thing, being rescued is, is a wonderful thing, and this is the good news that Jesus offers to everybody, that we can be rescued from the consequence of our sin. We can be rescued and have all of our sins washed away. We who are sinners can be as white as snow. I mean, that's great news. And I, again, I, I wish I was a better preacher. I wish I could, I wish I could help us... I, Open that up in a way that just thrilled your heart. But there's something else I want to talk to you about this morning. And it's latent to this verse. And that he died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. But unto him which died for them and rose again. So here's a concern that I think we all have to own and come to grips with today. Are you willing to worship God this morning? Are you willing to worship God this morning? No, I mean it. I, I really am. I'm just, I'm just a dude sharing with you. I'm a clay pot sharing with you the awesome message of the Word of God. And in this awesome message, I think there's something that you and I have to reconcile and get a, get a hold of in our own lives, every one of us, me too. And that is, God has far more for us than simply being saved. He has far more for you than simply being here on this Sunday morning. And I'm glad you're here. Thank God you're here. I'm glad you're here to worship him. I'm glad you're here to lift his name up and to adore him. But what is adoration? It is this concept that I have a great heartfelt affection where I simply with my life want to be in fellowship with this God who loves me. I want to walk with him. I want to love him. Do you want to love him more? Do you want to love him more? That's the, that's the idea. I want to love him more. Well, he says here <clears throat> that he didn't just save us or offer salvation so that we could be saved but that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And here's what I want to say as we step into this and I meddle a little bit. I think many want a costless Christianity. I'll say it again. I'll let it settle for you a second. I think many want a costless 
Christianity. I want to know I'm saved, but I don't want the Lord to cost me too much. I want to know I'm saved, but I really don't want the Lord to meddle with what I do. I really don't want the Lord to meddle with, with my life. I, I'm glad to know I'm saved, but I really don't want your meddling in my affairs. Now, we don't say it that way, but I think often we can act that way. And I'm going to tell you, I think it's rampant. In Christianity, I'm going to tell you, I think it's at the core of why we don't see laborers going into the harvest. Because I want to know I'm saved, but I don't really want the Lord to have all of my life. Now, there's lots of different ways we can be involved in being in the harvest. It takes lay people serving faithfully in your day-to-day -day life, doing what you do. But I want to tell you, it certainly involves people selling out vocationally to live by the gospel where they give their lives vocationally, that that is what they do with their lives. They are full-time servants of Christ. I'm going to tell you, I think that what's happening in verse 15 is largely at the core of why we're not seeing many go in to full-time ministry. Now, who knows if I'm right or not, but I can drive this home to your heart and to my heart and that God wants us to know that Coming to him is a life of living in relationship with him, where there is the love of Christ that constrains us. There is the love of Christ that controls us and motivates and guides us to the point of consecration, to the point of saying, Lord, here am I. Lord, do with my life whatever you want to do. Let me ask you, if you're not willing to say that, then what are you going to do with your life? Do you really want to face the King of Kings with this treasure of a life you've been given? And maybe you and, and God are the only ones that know, but he knows that you're not sold out for him. Do you think you can do a better job with your life than he can? Hello. Is God so untrustworthy that you can't give him your life? If you're going to trust your soul to him, how is it that we cannot trust our day-to-day -day lives to him? So let me ask you, hello, church family, we're together, we're, hello, this is one of those really quiet messages, right? Oh, move on to something else. Tell a joke, please. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. Listen, this is normal Christianity and God loves us to tell us this message. I'm going to tell you, he is giving you in this passage the happiest way you can go through life. The happiest way you can go through life is sold out to Jesus Christ. And are you ready for this? If it got quiet before, uh-oh. Did you know this is, this is exactly what God expects out of all of his children? Take your Bibles to Matthew 16. There goes the exposition. <laughs> Many want a costless Christianity. I don't know when it was the right time to say this, okay? I, I don't know when's the right time to say it. I think if many of you could come behind this pulpit, you would say it too. But I want to tell you something from the core of, of everything that I know to say to you, just as a testimony in my own life, I've never regretted one day of giving my life to Jesus. <clears throat> and I don't mean just a savior. I've never regretted one day of selling out to God and giving him my life and, and being a preacher. Uh, I, I think it's the craziest thing in the world that I get to do what I do. And you help me live by the gospel by paying me to do it. Praise God that I get to do this. But I've never regretted one day. Not one day. And, and is every day easy? No. Have people been mean to me? Sometimes. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you this from the bottom of my heart. 
Uh, and I, maybe I've been spoiled. I get it. Okay, maybe I've been spoiled. But I hear pastors often in conferences come together. And they talk about how they've many times quit on Monday morning. Do you think that happens? You bet it does. There have been many times where I've gone to bed with knots in my stomach and not able to sleep. And by the way, I'm telling you what I'm telling you, not because uh, uh, I've got some, some secret or power. I just think it's the grace of God. I have never regretted one day of being in ministry. But in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26, we read something where we recognize there is a control in Christianity. There is a control that God expects in his children, in his disciples. He says here in verse 24, won't we read these verses out loud together? Matthew 16, 24 through 26, reading with me. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What's the answer to that? What would you give in exchange for your soul? Well, it's amazing how easily and how slightly we will trade the things of the world for God. I want this, or I want that, I want this, or I want that. Now, in verse 24, I'm going to cut to the chase. Um, let me just give you a statement I wrote. Many of us have lost the principle that to be a Christian means that our lives, all of it, belong to God. In this passage, many wonder over what it means to take up a cross. There's a lot of debate over that. I mean, there's a lot of different explanations that people have given. I think there's good uh, doctoral grounding uh, in explaining what it means to take up your cross. But I think while we focus, focus on that latter part, saying, well, what does it mean to take up your cross? I actually think the answer is found right before it because hardly do we ever focus on the first part of verse 24. If any man will come after me, next phrase. All right, anybody come after me, next phrase, what is it? So what does it mean to take up your cross? I think the explanation is right there. Now, some would think, okay, so being a Christian means that I have to say no to this and no to this and no to this and no to this and no to this. The truth of the matter is, according to Romans chapter 7 and many other passages, our hearts are desperately wicked. We are prone to evil. Even when um, we want to do the right thing, we find that evil is present. Why? Because we are sinners. We have the natural born tendency to be a two-year-old sticking our fingers in the socket. That is, that is our natural tendency. Our natural tendency is to want the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, act the wrong way, behave the wrong way. It's our, our tendency. And let me ask you, does everything you want to do, is all that good for you? You know what I found? That everything I want to do is not good for me. I also found something else. You cannot travel and take four teenagers to visit two Bible colleges and eat pizza every day and look like them. <laughs> you can't. I'm like, well, I'm with the teenagers. I'll just eat another piece of pizza. I'm with the teenagers. I'll just go to the ice cream store again. I'm with the teenagers. And you know what? I, I walk by donuts and gain weight. I, I, it's, so everything that we want to do isn't what we ought to do. Is that true? Just because we want to do something doesn't make it right. And the truth is, if we live after our own passions, our own desires, you need to be careful of this. You may get just what you want.
Some of you have lived long enough to know that it's a blessing of God that you did not get everything that you wanted. But some of us are still striving to get what we want and walk with God as well. And even when those things are quite clearly divergent, the one from the other. I'm going to tell you that it's my view that across America and in, in its churches that a lot of the style of worship is simply what we want. And I'm not, by the way, I know that God has not told us exactly what worship looks like in style. I want to tell you something I'm concerned about. I don't want to be offering strange fire before the Lord. I don't want to, from, to use the Old Testament, strange incense before the Lord. I don't want to, just, did you know something? Just because you offer something to the Lord, it doesn't mean it pleases him. Just because we say I'm doing this in God's name doesn't mean he loves it. And I'm as deficient as anybody, and here's what it drives me to. I need this book. I need the Holy Spirit. I need guidance. And in that, it constrains me. I don't do everything I want to do. Sometimes my kids wish that was more so. Because when I travel with my kids, they often say, Dad, the older you get, the more you lose your filter. <laughs> this. Seniors, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we live long enough or we don't care. <laughs> and our kids are like, but you should. <laughs> uh, I know what I, I told the kids. I know when I've gone too far. When I si simply come into the room where they are and, and I haven't said a word. And when I come in the room, they go. That, that does happen sometimes. <clears throat> Listen, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Denying yourself is not some form of self-punishment that we do just to prove that we love Jesus. Jesus. Really, all it means is that your desires are filtered through the Word of God and the Spirit. And that whatever we desire is filtered through what His Word says and what His Spirit says in conjunction with the Word. Is, is there denial? Yeah, I'm going to tell you there are a lot of things in the world that I like, a lot of things that in my flesh I would do. It would embarrass you if I was to tell you all of my fleshly desires. But guess what? All I'm saying is I'm a human being, have the same flesh that you've got. And I'll tell you this, if it wasn't for, the, for God, you would all be embarrassed. Maybe we find some relief in the pressure here if we break down the Greek word deny. Maybe if we break down that Greek word deny, maybe we'll get some pressure off of us that says, oh, well, it doesn't really mean deny. It doesn't really mean that we have to be all that serious about it. If we just dive into the language, maybe we'll get some pressure off and, oh, okay. Well, here's what the word means. It means to deny utterly. It means to disown, disown. Thayer puts it this way, to affirm that one has no acquaintance or connection with someone. That's another one of my filters that I have that I know I've gone too far. When I do something in public and I look around to see my kids and they've gone pew. It also means, as a subset of, of Thayer's definition, uh, to forget oneself. Listen to this. Lose sight of one's self and one's own interests. Whoa. 
wait a second, I did not sign up for that. What did you sign up for? I didn't sign up for that. What did you sign up for? I just wanted fire insurance. There is no believer on the planet who comes to Christ and is not faced with the doctrine of lordship. No believer on the planet. And I don't think man gets to define for you what that is. I think the Lord defines what that is. And it's all about just loving him and being surrendered. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. So what do you really love more than him? Now, I, I'm going to get really pokey here with this. I'm going to tell you, sometimes we say we love the Lord, but we answer like Peter, and we really mean we like the Lord. Am I right? Come on now. By the way, I, do, I could be sitting right there having a preacher preach this to me, and I'm like, yeah, I need this. I, I, I need to own the doctrine that I am sold out to the Lord. Some of us, you know, we want, we want a Christianity that doesn't cost me much. Don't, you know, if it's going to involve coming to church and don't talk to me about Sunday school and Sunday night, no, my word. My life isn't all about the Lord. And by the way, I think you can come to Sunday school, you can come to Sunday morning, you can come to Sunday night, you can come to Tuesday night and still not be walking with God. But I'm telling you, folks, I think that all of us need to kind of a come up and in this day, right here, right now, where we are, are we sold out? I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to cut to the chase in this message. As deficient as I am, as broken as I am, and as, as, as much as I keep needing to hear this message, I want to be. I want to be sold out, and Lord, I want to surrender to this message. Even when my flesh wants to still hang on uh, to some of that control, I know the best thing, the best decision I can make in worshiping the Lord is making a decision to sell out for him. Will you join me? Now, the rest of this, passage, the rest of this uh, message is really just looking at what other scriptures say. Romans 12, 1, you don't even need it probably. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn there. It's going to be Romans 12 and Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 6, and Matthew 11. And we've only got 13 minutes? What? Don't get nervous. For you visitors, you're like, okay, I won't get nervous. Regular attenders are like, <laughs> we've been here before. <laughs> All right, Romans 12, 1. Would you read out loud with me, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What does God expect? We're supposed to present our bodies as a what? What does that mean? What's a living sacrifice mean? What does it mean? A living sacrifice, you can't get more sacrifice than to be soul, more sold out than to be sacrificed. You can't get more sold out than that. I'm dead to myself, alive to you. What do you want me to do? So I, I think, again, I, I know it gets quiet in these messages and I think there's a point of us that, that wants to get that pressure off. No! The pressure doesn't come off. The pressure of the Lord is, I want every bit of you, all of you, all of you. I want all of you so much that I, I, I gave my son to die on the cross for you so that you could be with me forever. And I'm not just waiting for that forever and eternity. He wants it now because he loves you. Why would we turn our backs on that? Why? It's because we think if I give my life to the Lord, he's going to take some good thing away from me. If I do what God says, somehow I'm going to miss some great big thing in my life that I always wanted. I want to tell you, God is better than your wildest dreams. But if you don't believe it, you won't sell out. 
And you know it, and so does God. Why do you have a message like this on September 18th, 2022? Why is this message here? This message is here because God wants all of his children consecrated, sold out, and loving him. The pressure doesn't come off in Romans 12, 1. Romans chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. Romans chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, whose are we? We are the Lord's. Now listen to verse 9. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might what? Be Lord both of the dead and the living. Now, when he says Lord there, he does mean exactly what he says. He's talking about control. But this control is a control based on a loving fellowship a relationship where he goes through all of life with you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? And then it ends in this most un uncomfortable but redundant drumbeat through Scripture. And ye are not your own. Wait a second. I didn't sign up for that. Well, God did. God signed up for it when he made you. And he made you, listen to me, he made you to know him. He made you so that you would sell out to him. He made you so that you would know and experience right now what it means to walk in fellowship with God. Now, is it going to be better in heaven? Yes, because we will not deal with the sin curse any longer. But he's made you to know him and to walk with him in fellowship right now. Again, I, I, I don't know how else to do this, but to say it again. What would your life be like without the Lord? Galatians 6, 14. Galatians 6, 14, and then I've got one last passage. But God forbid, Galatians 6, 14, that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's how this statement ends. By whom, speaking of Jesus, the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. You know what this means? The world is dead to me. What does it mean? Well, let me give you some owning of what it means. Part of what it means is let the world do what the world will do. I belong to Jesus. Let the world in its consternation worry over what kind of gender you're going to put on a piece of paper to self-identify. I belong to Jesus and I know who I am. I'm a sinner who needs the saving grace of Christ who says he accepts everybody that will come to him. Let the world scream on that I don't want to believe there's a God. I'm going to tell you, the more you study creation, the more you realize the utter foolishness of believing in evolution. It is utterly foolish, makes no sense in the world, but why do people believe it? Because it's that or God. Let the world deny him. I don't care if they want to call me a, a science denier, a science hater. Do we hate science? No. Matter of fact, what do we love? We love the truth. 
And what we hate is when something that is a lie is propped up as if it was truth when it is not. So let the world say what it will. I belong to Jesus. Because somebody doesn't like what you believe, have a backbone. Stand for Christ. Because everybody may say, you know what, well, they're a religious nut. Let them say it. Sell out for Jesus. Because the rest of the world surely doesn't look nutty. <laughs> right? I mean, really, right? I think we're living in perfect illustration all the time of the craziness of man without God. You can't get much more nutty than we are. I shouldn't say that because we keep proving it. <laughs> we keep a trying. Listen, I, I know some of this, this message might be offensive to somebody. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you what the Bible says. And if you think you can do a better life with you, a better job with your life than God can, you are really messed up. And you're really deceived. Now, but that message, by the way, goes to Christian and non-believer. This message really is written with the scope of believers. So this consecration, this isn't a message that, this is typically not necessarily an evangelistic message, though it's built off of evangelism. It's built off of children who've come to be, or people who've become to be the children of God through faith in the gospel. And in that relationship, we have this scope of reference that Paul does. And Paul says, I know that this life is not all there is. I know that God has called me. He's given me a hope in my future, but he's also constrained me. It's his love for me and the love of the world that, that drives me to do what I do. And in that driving, I recognize that there's a controlling influence and a controlling factor. And here's what you hear consistently over the scriptures, consistently over the prophets, consistently over the servants that were sold out for God. I'd rather suffer with Jesus than live for the world. Matthew 11. But I'm nervous about selling out. I'm nervous. If I give my life to God, he will start taking stuff from me. If I give my life to God, he'll start taking my money. Does God need your money? Matter of fact, God so doesn't need your money. He says, if you can't give in joy, don't do it. If I give my life to God, he might call me to go someplace I don't want to go. Do you have any stories in your Bible of people that ran from God? Give me a name. Jonah. Jonah. How'd that work out for Jonah? Not one of the smartest choices, huh? It's easy for us to look back on Jonah and go, Jonah, come on. But I think sometimes we live with that same idea. If I sell out to God, he's going to take from me and take from me. It's going to be hard and heavy and I won't want to do it. I won't want to sell out and God will take my life and destroy it. And somehow I'll miss out on every... If that's your view of God, you don't know the God of the Bible. What have you got to lose? Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, we read all of us together. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, read out loud with me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Read the last verse out loud again. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, for my yoke is easy and my burden. Do you believe that you can trust this God? Then do it.